screen as well. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 uh, is where we will spend our time. And then we will also go to Romans chapter number 12, verse 2. Uh, as we are, again, moving through this season of graduation, uh, I thought that our sermon series today, uh, as we're talking about lighting your load, we will talk about study. And uh, study is not something that should just be only limited uh, to your uh, matriculation through school, but you should also imagine that uh, study is a lifelong uh, objective. And uh, if you're not smarter tomorrow than you were today, then you have missed out on a great gift from God. Uh, so uh, turn with me and let's imagine what the biblical text will say to us, particularly as we are uh, moving through this series of Lights in Your Load. Second uh, Timothy chapter number 2, verse 15. I'll read both the New Revised Standard Version and the message. Uh, the New Revised says, do your best or study to present yourself to God as one approved by God, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly explaining the word of truth. The message version says, concentrate on doing your best for God. Work you won't be ashamed of, laying out the truth plain and simple. And then Romans chapter 12, verse number two, it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Somebody say transformation. By the renewing of your minds, so that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Uh, so I want to spend a few moments just talking uh, about the ultimate graduation, uh, one done through study. Bow your heads with me as we pray and ask the blessings of the Lord to be here with us. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. I pray, God, that you will send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and even the hearers of this word. I pray, God, that you will allow us to grow and to be transformed as we think, pray, and reflect in this season and moment. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Now, I am one who believes very much so that when Jesus tells us to love the Lord God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our spirit, how many of you know he also says all of our mind? Hello, somebody. That to follow Jesus, to be a follower of the ways of God, is not... Uh, totally complete and fulfilled if you are checking your mind out of the process as you are attempting to have the power and formation of God working on your heart, your soul, and your spirit. It is indeed, I think, a very uh, powerful and unfortunate reality of modernity and post-modernity. This breaking up of the human person into these silos or, or, or uh, sectors where we lose the appreciation of the interconnectedness of even ourselves. Because how many of you know that often if we're talking about health, you cannot be healthy if your mind is not being attended to as well. Hello, somebody. I mean, we did Mental Health Awareness Sunday a couple weeks ago. We were all in here doing the rolling of the shoulders and mindfulness and all kind of stuff. Why? Because for many of us, we don't slow our mind down long enough 
for it to recover from the assault of this world, these ideas of our own trauma that is often brought to us sometimes through our own decision making and equally if not more so a result of things that are often outside our direct control. In this way, I find then the admonition of scripture to be critical. For if you and I are not cultivating the muscles of our mind through study and reflection, you will not be able to have the experience that we witnessed earlier today where folks are moving from one level or cycle of education to another. Now, it is worth saying that you can find yourself, if you are not careful, allowed to pass through without being actually trained in your mind. And I know this to be true because when I worked uh, here for my first five or six years here in the city of Berkeley, uh, in the continuation school, we had many young people who would come to us in the 10th grade and they could not read, yes. Yes. could not do basic math. And as we looked at their cumulative folder, we would see that their grades have been terribly underperforming for years. It's not as if they got to 10th, 11th grade and they forgot to read. They forgot to do math. They forgot to write complete sentences. Is that somebody else was not invested in them learning and studying in such a way where they would not just keep passing them along so they could have a fake graduation but not have the tools necessary to enact and actualize their God-given potential. My brothers and sisters, it is of ultimate concern and importance that if you're going to lighten the loads that are often working in your life, in my life, we must be people committed to studying not just at church on Sunday, at school throughout the week, but even those things that folk may not necessar necessarily want to expose to you. Uh -huh. Hello, somebody. Because how many of you know that there is some wisdom and knowledge that you can stumble into? <laughs> Touch your neighbor, somebody. And folk will be like, oh, you learned that. Yes, I did learn that. No thanks to you. This is some of my own studying, my own cultivation of knowledge and wisdom. And part of what I want to impress upon you and I today is that we are people who must have a voracious appetite for study. You cannot accomplish God's best for your life and not study not be a student. If you think you've learned it all because you got your degree from Cal, from the seminary, or from the streets, tell your neighbor, you don't have enough information. Amen. Don't you know that there's always somebody God has placed around you that can help you grow as Peter told his audience, in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That you always got room to grow. Pat yourself on the chest and say, I got some room to grow. I know that I, I know that I know a lot. <laughs> but I don't know everything. Amen. Amen. And how many know there's a great distance between a lot and everything? I wish I could talk to somebody in here today. You may know a lot about, you know, uh, you know, carpentry, but do you know everything about auto 
automobiles. You may know a lot about being a player, but do you know everything about being faithful? I wish I could talk to somebody. You may know a lot about being in church, but do you know a lot about following Jesus? You may know a lot about the Bible, but do you know everything about God's will for your life? Tell your neighbor, there's a difference between a lot and everything. And you and I have to be people who do not get so caught up in what we think we know. That there's no room for us to close the gap. Lord, I feel like preaching that thing right there. Between a lot and everything. Let me move to my points because I don't have a, few, a, a, a long time here. The first thing that you must be if you are going to have an ultimate graduation related to your study is you must be first thing a lifelong learner. Yes. Everybody say lifelong learner. Lifelong. 2 Timothy 2.15 2, it says study to show you are approved by God. Again, my brothers and sisters, I remember uh, when I was uh, 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 in, in my seminary courses, uh, one of my elder uh, uh, professors, he, he said, in spiritual formation, this is very interesting, you can know a lot in your head, but it will take a while for it to transfer to your heart. Think about this for a second, right? Because I, I got a few degrees, and I'm proud of them. I mean, I'm still paying on them, so I better have some pride about something. Jeez, Lord, help me. Amen. Some of y'all, amen. You know, you know, they, 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 they used to tell me, why are you, why, why are you paying all that money to, 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 to go to school? You should go get you a car. And I see them outside, you know, waxing their car every day. And I used to be ashamed that I didn't have a nice car while I'm struggling going to school. But I tell you what. My car was my tuition, praise God. And, and I wax on and wax off. <laughs> Very frequently. He said, it takes a while for every person to move from the head knowledge to the heart. Think about all the stuff you've learned. The stuff that was taught to you. And how you knew it was some truth there, and you knew you probably needed to do it, but it took a while for it to actually take root in your heart. Paul said it like this, the things that I want to do, I can't do. And the things that I don't want to do, I do. Who shall save me from this wretched person that I am? Thanks be to God. I've got to add thanks be to God on there. If you just leave it at the wretched person that I am, that can feel a little hopeless. But we often say thanks be to God. Everybody practice that. Say thanks be to God. Thanks be to God that God does not leave us with just the head knowledge, but God is calling you and I to be a lifelong learner. Why? So as the things move from my head to my heart, I can always have new replace what's moving or to build upon what's moving from my head to my heart. From the knowledge to action. And studying is critical because many of us can get caught in only the ivory tower part of the, this learning. And not be able to move into the action. I want to submit, and I do indeed believe, that it is important for you and I to be lifelong learners. Now, the, the only dangerous thing about being a lifelong learner, for some, is that that means you kind of have to give up or let go of things you thought were true when you learn them in a previous iteration of your learning cycle. Now, I'm not talking about you letting go of Jesus. You hold on to Jesus now. I mean that with all of my heart, mind, body, and soul. But hanging on to 
to Jesus don't mean you got to hang on to everything that has often been associated with Jesus. I remember from uh, working through the birth of a nation and we're pulling together a social impact campaign for faith leaders because in the movie it has a very powerful, uh, really expose, if you will, on the legitimization of violence by religion, particularly American, white, Christian, social, and civil religion. And I got to be that specific. Because some of the, you, if you listen to Nat Turner, amen, Nat Turner is able to read the same scriptures and eventually create a whole different kind of religious response. <laughs> Touch your neighbor. And I'm telling you, that they're going to shake up some folk when that movie hit the, hit the theaters, right? But it still raises the question, what is it about what can happen to us when we get stuck in what we've been told to believe and not commit ourselves to learning for the rest of our life? When, when Timothy is told by Paul, who is writing this to him, at the end of his life, Timothy is being challenged by Paul, listen, keep studying so you can be approved by God. Why? Because there are going to be some things in your youth, Timothy was a young man, that you have not learned yet. And you better keep studying so as you get older, you can still be approved by God. I want us to be a congregation, people of God, followers of Jesus, who are not afraid to open our whole lives up to being lifelong learners. So the first question that I have you think about is what part of your life needs your commitment to be a lifelong learner? Some of us are really good at being lifelong learners in our personal careers. We take all kind of good professional development classes. Amen? Right? Because you know there's some money attached to the end of that, right? If I get this certificate, woo, got a raise coming. Touch your neighbor somebody. But are you a lifelong learner in your relationships? Are you a lifelong learner in your political and global geopolitical uh, uh, consciousness? Me going to Palestine was an act of me being a lifelong learner. Because I mean, know when you learn some stuff, you can't just erase that out of your mind. There's some stuff I saw that I just can't make sense of, so now I'm stuck in cognitive dissonance. And I can't live my life learning new things without having to wrestle with the old information I've had. Pat yourself on the chest and say, I need to be a lifelong learner. <clears throat> the second thing that I'll lift up real quickly here is if you're going to be someone who will have graduation seasons of your life related to study, you must listen, have the capacity, or oh, touch me, for a renewable mind. Everybody say renewable mind. Renewable mind. Romans 12, 2, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I don't have the time to read it like I want to, but I want you all to go home and Google Dr. Martin Luther King's speech, sermon, message called the Transformed Nonconformist. I want you to just read it. It's a good read this week. Can y'all do that for me? I mean, I promise you it will bless you. He got a few words in there, but since you're Googling it, then you can just put the word that you don't understand in Google, and it'll, it'll, it'll define it for you. Amen. But read Transform Nonconformance. It is Dr. King's, for me, one of his most powerful expressions of how what the world needs right now are people whose mind have been renewed and transformed in such a way where you are not just going with the status quo of injustice and arbitrary violence in the world. Now, for many of us, the challenge of having a renewed mind is that our minds can often be too closed. Listen, because we only are listening. 
listening to the teachers that look like us, think like us, and kind of, you know, agree with everything we agree with. That kind, I'm just here to tell you, now this may sound kind of weird coming from a preacher, amen, but you need to be open in your mind to different ideas and voices that can help your mind be renewed through the power of God's Spirit. There are people with different perspectives who are followers of Jesus that God can use to help change your mind about a lot of things that your mind needs to be changed about. Who it got quiet in here real quick. Who are the people on your bookshelves? Give you something real concrete and practical that you read voraciously but don't challenge your thinking. Can't expand your reflection. What are the ideas that you and I must be open to having our minds renewed about? I do think some of the challenges happening in our world is because we don't have enough people whose minds are open to being renewed because too many of our minds have been shaped by very narrow thoughts and ideas that are not about God, but more about culture, more about politics, more about all kinds of things that God can't be boxed in with. I love a book I used to read back in the day. It said, God is not Democrat or Republican, which was quite a revelation to some folk. It may still be quite a revelation to some folk. How many of you know that you can't put God in a box? And the moment you try to say what God is for exclusively, how many of you know that you can get in a mess? Because if you look at the life of Jesus, Jesus seemed to always be kind of side with everyone that all the religious folk were convinced God was not in their corner. I wish I could talk to somebody in here. Having a renewed mind means, particularly as you're studying, Lord, how can I do this study, this learning in such a way where what I'm reading, the word I'm reading, the studies I'm engaged in, the people I'm studying with can help push my thinking beyond parochialism, exclusivity. But God, I can be as accepting as you are. I mean, I, I tell a lot of folk minimally, if God says he doesn't have any pleasure in the death of anyone, then the minimal response by every follower of God should, not, should be to not cause death. Do no harm. I mean, you may not agree with who they praying to, who they dating, what kind of money they have or don't have. But if you are following God, could it be a lifelong commitment for us to learn how do we not cause harm? Because of difference. Hello, somebody. I mean, you know, these these contemporary issues of folk coming home from jails and prisons. I, I often am, am struck by how easy it is for people who do not know folk coming home from jails and prisons to have all these ideas about what folk need who are coming home from jails and prisons. And I say often to the clergy across country that we work with, when's the last time you actually sat down with someone who has come home from jail or prison and ask them what they needed, rather than assuming what they needed. 
our LGBT brothers and sisters. When was the last time you actually sat down with an LGBT person, whether you, you know, feel comfortable with them or not, and just listen to their story? And then try to, you know, determine, help them determine their eternal destination. But just try to walk with them through life. Because how many know you can't get to eternity until you at least go through life? I wish I could talk to somebody in here today. Much of my own transformation around some of these issues has just happened by me sitting down with people at our church. Don't you know there's all kind of difference in this room? I'm looking out here, I see black, white, Asian, Latino, gay, straight, international students, citizens. I see some of y'all who's rich. I can tell by your clothes, praise God. <laughs> see some of y'all who, you know, economically, you know, we, we shop at Marshalls and Ross and Goodwill. Amen. And I thank God for that. Amen. I'm not upset with none of that. I see some of us who are renters, some of us who are homeowners, some of us who are in transition. And wouldn't it be something if our community actually crossed difference and spent time with each other and not allowed the world to make the labels keep us from learning each other's story? Because how many of you know you are more than the label someone will put on you? So I may not like that, you may not, you may not like that I'm black, but can you at least like that I don't know I'm a human being? How about that? You may, I may not like that you a, a, a LeBron fan, amen. Who about to lose tomorrow? Touch your neighbor, somebody, right? But I can at least appreciate that you like sports. You may be a, a Muslim and I may be a Christian or a Jew or agnostic or a secularist, but can I at least acknowledge that we have a shared humanity? And can we start with what we agree on so our minds can be opened in such a way that the difference won't trump our shared commonality? But you got to study a little bit to get over that difference. You got to spend time with folk. You got to sit at some folks' feet and let them teach you what you don't know. Some of the intergenerational tension that is happening is because some of our young people are studying a whole different syllabus than what some of us study. And then some of all who's older than me, my dad and them, amen, their syllabus was way different than mine. <laughs> and my syllabus is much different than some of these young folk. But that's why we need intergenerational relationships. Final thing I'll say. Oh, what's this next point here? What's this, this question? Uh, what are the teachers of perspective, teachers or perspectives needed to inform your thinking to create space for a renewable mind? This is a good question for you to wrestle with this week. Are there others, quote unquote, whoever you define as the other in your life that you need to welcome into your space? Do you make space for these others so you can see how the Spirit of God may actually help you to grow in what you think you know or don't know. Final thing I'll say, Hebrews chapter, or I'm sorry, that, that shouldn't be Hebrews, that should, that should be Romans chapter 12 verse 2. Prove God's will. Everybody say, prove, prove God's will. It says, study to show yourself approved unto God. Workmen, work people, people who are not Ashamed to rightly divide the word of truth. Be not conformed to this word, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? So you can prove the will of God. Proving the will of God is not about scientific uh, apparatus or tools. The better word probably should be discern. You can make a decision based off of the growing knowledge that you have, that we have, what is God's will for this situation I'm in? As I study, as I submit myself to the transformation of the renewing of my mind, can I make space to understand that I always have a choice for God's will to be made manifest in my life? What is God's will for me in this relationship? 
what is God's will for me in this neighborhood I'm in, in this season of service, in this vocation? What is God's will and how am I studying in such a way where I can unlock information both old and new that can help me be able to discern God's will for my life? It is important for you to be able to prove or discern God's will. Why? Because God's will, here's some good proof, is always good. It's always acceptable. And it is always perfect. God's will is good. Everybody say that. God's will is good. What does that mean? It means that God has some best intentions for you. So if you are trying to decide and discern what is the will of God for my life, part of what you should be able to ascertain in the process of your study, God, is this going to work out in a positive uh, result for me, for we? If you're in a relationship and that relationship is abusive, guess what? That's not the good will of God. So somebody needs some walking papers. Whoever's doing the abusing, that's not good a goodwill, so you don't stay in that because that's not a good thing. Love how Sister Tia was talking about how sometimes you have to prioritize your health over some of these other things. Why? Because if you're not healthy, how many know you can't be your best self. So if you can prioritize your health, that is a good thing. Somebody say acceptable. Acceptable. It is important for us to appreciate that, you know, there are some things that God does not accept. And, you know, the church is always good about focusing on things that we are convinced God does not accept. But, you know, there are some things that God makes it very clear. He don't accept lying lips. <laughs> I don't know if she'll be lying all the time. See how you ain't lift your hand? Just lying all up in church. God does not like a greedy person. When the last time you heard the United States of America talk about greed? A nation, one nation under God. We the most greedy nation in the world. Violent. I ain't even got to no sex yet. I know everybody waiting for me to get to sex, but ain't that something? <laughs> Greed, violence, lying. Hello, somebody. I think it's important for us to appreciate, you know, that God is trying to get many of us to, to, to really ask some hard questions about what are you trying to create and shape in me? Dr. King, again, if I were to pull his word, says that our country is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. Then we are surprised when violence meets us in our daily lives. Why wouldn't it? Our whole country has been founded on violence. So until we can exercise this violence out of our culture and our country, then we're going to have a violent problem. That's why the church must be the leaders in exercising violence out of our world and our lives. But many of us, because we think that we have a right to violence, not acceptable. It's not acceptable. Not acceptable. So some of us have to study peacemaking. Ways of nonviolent conflict resolution. I know I'm not preaching and shaking the mic today, but you know, I hope this is gonna help some of you on your job not get fired this week. I hope it's gonna help some of your neighborhood not take it and you catch a case this week. It's gonna help some of you in your relationships to scale it back a little this week. What does it mean for you to study nonviolence? Study solving conflict without having to use force or coercion. To trust it, man, if I got to use violence and force to get my way, maybe it's not my way. 
<laughs> Maybe my way is not the way I need right now. And I, I got to admit, I struggle with that because I look at some of this injustice in the world and I just be like, you know what? Hmm. I could fix this real quick. Anybody ever felt like that? You look at some stuff and you're just like, ooh, I can work this out. I'll just give you a quick little anecdote on a super small level. I remember we was in Great America one time, and we saw one of the kids, you know, just falling on the ground, little Johnny. We all seen little Johnny's store. You know, I want this and I want that, and they won't get it, and they just rolling on the ground. And some of us, you know, who come from some similar backgrounds, looking at each other like, we can, we can. We, we, we know, we, I can fix it. Lord knows I can fix that thing. And it's so interesting that I was so convinced of that before I had my own kids. Now, you know, you just kind of feel like, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Amen. <laughs> Learning nonviolence, I think, is an important lesson particularly on the heels of all this violence that's happening. Undoing our bias and bigotry towards one another. Sometimes we gotta study and learn that that stuff is actually manufactured. Don't you know all of us, we have bias that is unconscious to us? You can go to a Harvard website today with all that Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, swinging from the chandeliers, rolling on the floor, Walking on water, raising the dead, and the Harvard implicit bias test will show you who you have a natural bias towards. Just being a follower of Jesus don't erase your bias. You got to study even your own self so you can be, listen, a worker approved by God. Why? Because God don't accept bigots, racists. Now this is, you know, the grace of God is a magnificent concept and I'm just going to have to hold out till the end to see how magnificent this grace is. Because I am convinced some folk just can't be in heaven with me. I am convinced of that. But then amazing grace. How sweet the, I, that saved a wretch like me. So, you know, I, I, I don't want to believe I'm a wretch. I want to think I'm better than, you know, the slave owners or better than the killer cops or better than, you know, all these other folk. But how many know that, you know, there is another biblical principle that says that all of our righteousness when compared to Jesus is as filthy rags. So some of this is it's really going to be up to the end. I guess my whole point, though, is as we're going along this process of lightening your load, your load will get lighter if you can learn to drop off bigotry, bias, bad habits. But you got to study and find out what those things are. Sometime in your prayer, God will bring things to you. You're going to have to study, take some extra steps to research what is this that's inside of me? Why is it that my body is addicted to sugar like this, to liquor like this, to tobacco like this? To the, to the bud, you know, the earth, you know, stuff that always got extra stuff in there. What is that about? Some of us need to study addiction. Study these things so you can be free from them. The spirit can set you free. Hello, somebody. If we open ourselves to study. Let's stand to our feet.